<clears throat> the two types, in Red Hat Cluster Service, it's the Fence D daemon. In Pacemaker, it's the Stonus daemon. There's actually two types now. Yeah, so in, in, in Pacemaker, we actually have two incarnations of, of the, the Stonus daemon, one for the 1.0 and one for the 1.1 release. But anyhow, it's essentially the same concept. So once the caller has gathered up the information, part of the information it gathers is what agent do you use? The cluster can't be aware of all the different types of hardware fence devices that are out there. So instead, every hardware fence device comes with its own specialized agent that knows how to talk to the actual hardware. And that's the actual agent. It takes the information from the caller, acts on it, confirms the machine, or that the call has been successful, and then returns the successful failure to the actual caller. So the agent is the hardware-specific layer. The caller is the upper layer that talks to the cluster. Now, one thing, fence agents ideally have a method of confirming the node is truly dead. It's, as part of the API, it's a highly desirable trait, but it's not a required trait. Um, the main reason for that is switch PDUs are a classic example. They can only tell when they've popped the relays. They can't tell whether the machine is truly powered off or not which is part of the reason why it's so critical when you configure it in the first place, you test it. So the major types are IPMI, um, and then it's derivatives, um, Dell's DRAC, HP's ILO, IBM's RSA, and Switch PDUs. <clears throat> and the, the, the Meatware one is basically warrants a little bit of the story in itself. Meatware is, is, a, um, <laughs> is an interesting term for human intervention. Uh, how many of you have had um, the, the, the prospect of, uh, I have to set up some form of high availability cluster, but for some reason or another, I cannot do automatic failover, such as I have, th those are in two different buildings, for example, and I, I can't always guarantee reliability of communications. Have you had that? It's something that you, it's something that you get relatively often. So that's one thing that Meatware is good for. Um, it's, it basically disables automatic failover except if an operator actually clears it. So that's one way, if you have, like for example, a, 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 a pacemaker cluster over two different buildings, maybe in two different, entirely two different locations, and you can't make sure that you have absolutely reliable communication links between them, that's one way of being able to just set up your stack as a full cluster service, meaning you get all of your dependencies right, etc., etc. You've got your virtual IP addresses, your servers, your your DOBD resources, your access to shared storage, whatnot. You basically define the whole stack and you can easily uh, fire it all up and bring it all down. But for um, an actual transition toward a different site, you want manual interaction. That's one thing that Meatware is really good for. And also, in Pacemaker, uh, there is, and also in Red Cluster, there is, the there is the, a possibility of doing staggered fencing. So we can do, we can have a, a a primary fencing device, and in case fencing for that fails, then we can have a secondary device. And of course, that is another thing that we can use Meatware for. So it's used, for example, IPMI fencing or fencing via PDU or whatnot. And if that fails, still allow a manual override because that will ultimately get your cluster going in. As in, we have an, an, an administrator intervening and saying, yes, I have. Uh, I have manually confirmed that all of the access paths to shared resources are now interrupted or that node is in fact down and now I can continue with the failover process by using uh, what we call meatware fence. Now, I would like to point out that's not supported by Red Hat. Red Hat, you technically can do meatware fencing, <clears throat> but don't ask for help. They're going to be like, where's your fence device? To clarify that, that's not supported by Red Hat the company, <laughs> not not supported by Red Hat Cluster the product. Yes. Manual fencing? Yeah. Fence, fence manual. Um, fence manual. Yeah. Fence it's, manual. Not a, it's not a device that you configure, it's just a command that you run. It basically blocks the cluster until a human intervenes. And by the way, if you're familiar with FenceAct manual, Meatware works very, very similarly. Basically, it opens a socket, and then you have a client that basically throws a magic cookie into that socket, and then that means you're safe to proceed. The new fencing stuff works more like the Red Hat stuff. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. Okay, so most important question. Why do we care? So why is this important? What is it that fencing actually uh, protects against or helps us make sure that it doesn't break when things go wrong, as we said 
in, in deleted. So, shared storage access, this is something that I've alluded to previously. Uncoordinated access to shared storage is a fantastic way to wreck your data. It's really great. So consider we have um, a logical unit somewhere on a SAN, so that's what we use. We import that one as a, as a local SCSI device, obviously. And uh, that local SCSI device is available on all of our cluster nodes because that's our single instance storage. That's one way of doing a highly available uh, cluster. We have single instance storage and then we have multiple servers. So when you do this with a, a, normal, uh, uh, a normal file system, such as ext3, ext4, whatever you have, um, then that's basically perfectly fine as long as there's only ever one cluster node that is accessing, i.e. mounting the file system. If that's not the case, if you have multiple devices writing or multiple you have a file system writing from multiple nodes to the same single instance device. Like I said, you're signing up for shredding your data. And if you consider that in the, in the, in the cluster case, you have this one node that you think is down and you think is no longer writing to the device. If you now were to switch your service over to the other node and that node starts to happily write to that same device, you better find out really, really quick and bust out your backups really, really quickly because you're in effect, in effect getting uncoordinated access to, to, one, to one shared storage device. But luckily, there's one way of doing it is with fencing, obviously. Make sure that only one of the nodes ever accesses, accesses this. And then we have another option, and that is using a cluster file system, but believe it or not, that too requires fencing. <clears throat> with a cluster file system, with the XT3, if you have two machines try to access it at the same, or try to use the same block device at the same time, they're not aware that writes might come from somewhere else. Which is why you set yourself up for shredding the data. GFS2 and OCFS2 are clustered file systems that do allow simultaneous read-write access from multiple nodes at the same time. But even then, you still have to do that by coordinating blocks. Um, and in order to keep that same, you have to have fencing. So even though you can talk from multiple locations, there's a coordination that's happening behind the scenes. And if the cluster communication breaks, that coordination breaks. And the only way to safely proceed is to fence the machine, or fence the node that's offended. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have, uh, have experience with, with clustered file systems, so, such as GFS2, OCFS2, right? Yeah, a few. Um, and I guess you're all aware that uh, those file systems use what we call a distributed lock manager, or DLM. Right? A DLM is a distributed service that runs on all of the cluster nodes and that coordinates access to locks. It's basically when an application requires a lock from, from the file system, it's ultimately the DLM that dishes out these locks and coordinates them cluster-wide, precisely for the purpose of preventing uncoordinated access to specific areas in the file system. Oversimplistically speaking, it makes sure that one single block that's being out, that's being used by the file system is, is never written to simultaneously from more than from more than one node. However, um, when we take the case of a misbehaving node into account, then we basically have to exclude this node from the whole blocking mechanism. And also, what's even more important is that we basically have to freeze pretty much anything that the lock manager does until that misbehaving node has either reappeared in the cluster, that is, it just had a brief glitch and it stopped responding for two seconds and now everything's fine again, or it has actually been fenced off the cluster. Why? Same thing. We now have a, a node that is potentially doing access to the storage, because after all, it might still have file handles open. Uh, we have a node that is now potentially doing uncoordinated access to the storage, which is the same thing as what we described earlier, why fencing in storage access is important. We now have this one node, it's no longer playing nicely in the whole, uh, in the whole DLM infrastructure, and now we need to make sure that, number one, we remove that node from the cluster, and number two, very important, we freeze all I.O. on the file system in the entire cluster until we've rectified the situation. So if I could walk through an example, a specific example. You have two nodes. Both of them are mounting the same shared storage. They're both using GFS. 
One node says to the lock manager, DLM, hey, I want to work on this lock device. Can I have a lock, please? It gets the lock, starts about its work, and then hangs. Didn't actually die, it just hangs. Now, at that point, because it has a lock, anything else, any of the other nodes on the cluster, they want to write to the same system. They ask DLM, and DLM says, sorry, somebody else has the lock space, you can't use it. And during that time, the cluster declares the machine dead. Now, if we just ignored fencing, or if we used fence act manual and you just cleared it because you were in a hurry and you had a fire and you didn't bother looking at the problem properly, DLM now thinks that, okay, that machine's gone, and now offers the lock to the other machine goes back and starts replaying the journals, doing its thing, putting things back in a nice place, and then starts using it. The other node suddenly wakes up from whatever was freezing it, thinks it still has a valid lock, and goes back to writing on the disk. You've just shredded your data. That's why you have to make sure you've completely isolated the offending node from the cluster. Be it because you've kicked it out, or be it because you've cut it, or cut it off from storage. With power fencing, it's obviously gone, it's coming back up, it's got nothing. But if it's been fabric fenced, even if it wakes up, it says, oh, I've got the lock, I can finish my right now. It's going to be, okay, no, I can't. 